Well, the Prime Minister will be speaking shortly from now at the UNGA. He is expected to outline India's vision on the global stage. What is it that India is doing for development, peace, regional security, and of course, importantly, of, uh, climate change as well? This could be in sharp contrast to the Pakistan Prime Minister's speech at the UNGA later tonight, which could focus heavily on just Kashmir. And this uh, is, of course, the Prime Minister tweeting just minutes before his speech on your screens, all set for the UN General Assembly session. Uh, this goes live and we'll of course be cutting across to that as well and we'll be getting you all the perspective cutting uh, to our reporters in New York and our studios as well there with Palki Sharma Upadhyay. We're also joined uh, here in the studio. Uh, in the studio with us is Amy Katzman who is the South Asia Bureau Chief for the Financial Times. Uh, also joining us is Brahma Chalani, Professor of Strategic Studies at the Center of Policy Research and also with us is um, Ambassador Leela Punappa, former deputy NSA, who is joining us live from New Delhi as well. Uh, if I can uh, go across to Amy Kasman uh, first. Amy, your, your thoughts on what the Prime Minister's broad outline for this speech is going to be. And we know that he's already spoken a little bit about development, about climate change and a whole host of issues, including, of course, the South Asia region. What do you think he will be talking about? Look, I think Prime Minister Modi's goal is very much to project India as, um, you know, a, an up-and-coming or newly arriving global power, a leader of the multilateral community, which is playing a constructive role in the international system, helping the world to tackle issues of yeah. global concern. So I think he's very much likely to focus, first of all, on um, communicating to the world the steps that his government has taken to try to strengthen mm -hmm. India and, you know, because only by a strong domestic, mm -hmm. you know, economy and society can can you be really a world leader on the global stage? And mm. then I think he's likely to focus on a host of issues of concern to the international community. Mm -hmm. Among those will be issues of climate change, the environment. Um, I think he is likely to talk about international terrorism as a mm. concern um, and something that the international community needs to work together to combat. And there'll be references to Pakistan, but most likely. I think that the... Oh, he may skip it in entirely. <laughs> I think he will not skip it entirely. There's mm. been too much background noise about Kashmir. Yeah. There's no doubt that, you know, the issue of Kashmir mm -hmm. and what's happening there is percolating around, um, you know, in in the West, in New York, where, where this meeting is taking place. But I think that he will not be interested in getting into the nitty gritty, mm -hmm. but he will be interested in presenting India as a country that has been the victim of international terrorism right. emanating from its neighbor, um, at, which is using terrorism as a tool of, you know, a policy tool, mm -hmm. you know, in a long-standing rivalry. Right. So I think that will be the kinds of, you know, India as a country that has experienced the mm -hmm. cost, the high cost of terrorism, yeah. you know, firsthand and that wants to align with the world to yeah. stamp out this menace. Right. I'm also going to go across to Brahma Chalani and Ambassador Punapa in just a bit, but uh, we just wanted to play out this uh, report that my colleague Sidhan Sibyl has sent from New York. Well, it's the grand finale of uh, the Prime Minister's week-long visit, but uh, today will be the focus, the big focus on Prime Minister's big speech, uh, the second speech since 2014. And I expect uh, the Indian Prime Minister to give his vision, his roadmap about his plan and how India is a solution provider, how India is a leader and India can be looked up to solve glo global problems. And that will be the primary focus because the Indian Prime Minister is not going to waste this opportunity at the world stage on Pakistan. He understands that Pakistan is a nuisance. We saw what happened yesterday at the SAAC meeting where uh, Vion was present and the Pakistani foreign minister said that he will not enter the room till the Indian uh, foreign minister finishes his uh, statement, his speech, which shows that uh, the juvenile behavior of the Pakistani establishment and do expect the Pakistani prime minister to also indulge in that. But by and large, India's focus remains on the big picture on India's vision to the world. In fact, if I can tell you the, the number of bilaterals, the Indian Prime Minister, the Indian External Affairs Minister, the Junior Minister in the Indian External Affairs Ministry, uh, along with the Environment Minister who was also here, had is almost 100. They met world leaders, they met uh, their counterparts, the foreign ministers and discussed about challenges like climate change like uh, terrorism, like uh, uh, the, the problem of uh, uh, 
cleanliness these were the things which were were discussed by the indian prime minister in fact the indian prime minister was given uh, the goalkeepers award he spoke at a lecture on gandhi the relevance of gandhi and also inaugurated the solar park which is on the roof of the building behind behind me which is the united nations headquarters so lot of development a lot of output when it comes to indian prime minister's week long visit from houston to new york and focus clearly on making sure that uh, uh, to tell the world that india has arrived uh, on the world stage as a global leader All right, and uh, you know, if I can come to you, Brahman Chalani. Now, what do you think? You know, obviously there are going to be contrasts between the you know the speech of the Prime Minister, Prime Minister Modi, and Imran Khan, who's also speaking today, um, and whether he, Imran Khan's speech will be heavily focusing on Kashmir, and what is really going to be the takeaway from that? Because we know that even with his um, in his meeting with uh, President Donald Trump, he talked a little, a lot about Kashmir. But what is the leverage that Pakistan has when it comes to Kashmir, and uh, you know, at the UN GA? Every year, a number of world leaders come to the United Nations General Assembly hmm. in September and give speeches to the General Assembly, and often these speeches are really addressed to home audiences. Yeah, because the world is too preoccupied with many issues. The United States is now preoccupied with you know right. with this uh, impeachment inquiry against Trump. Therefore, whatever Modi or Imran Khan hmm. says at the UNGA. Hmm. will be largely directed at their home audience hmm. but the contrast between modi and imran khan is stark hmm. modi was elected in the largest ever election in world history hmm. while imran khan as the opposition in pakistan describes him hmm. is a selected prime minister selected by the military hmm. and imran khan is under military pressure hmm. to take a hard line against india yeah now he himself admitted the other day in new york that his kashmir strategy is going nowhere hmm. so he will keep harping on kashmir but by contrast modi i'll be very surprised even if he mentions pakistan by name yeah he will probably do what he did at the houston rally which is to talk about pakistan indirectly hmm. in the context of terrorism the failure to observe basic international norms yeah but we in india will pay a lot of attention to what modi says and what imran khan says but i but think rest of the world the rest of the world will yeah. not be bothered about of what either says of course and also of course, uh, donald trump uh, in his own speech at the unga was only focusing on china and trade so you know every leader comes there and talks about issues that are important to them but talking about donald trump i mean he he said that he's had fantastic meetings with both the indian prime minister and the pakistani prime minister uh, the the indian side thought there were mixed sign signals from him you know uh, in terms of what he was trying to say where do you see donald trump uh, when it comes to the kashmir issue he he says he wants to mediate then he goes back on it then he says well i'll mediate if both sides agree to it and then he calls imran khan a great friend and he calls uh, you know prime minister modi elvis uh, so it's you know so much happening there when it comes to donald trump Yes. I mean, first of all, Donald Trump is a man who can say one thing today and it's precise opposite tomorrow yeah. and probably mean both equally <laughs> at exactly that moment that he has said it. Yes. So, um I mean, I think he's not a man who kind of sticks to the script. He doesn't read the briefing. I mean, I I think um he does fancy himself the great negotiator and thus probably by extension the great mediator mm -hmm. and indeed he probably likes Imran Khan who's a you know who has a history as a major sports star great the kind athlete. of guy that Donald Trump would like at the same time he's clearly seen you know that Narendra Modi is the Elvis of Indian politics yeah. and he's been you know kind of bowled over by the you know the crowd which is something that hmm. um you know is something that he really appreciates so I mean to be honest But what do you think is the I, policy direction that we're going in when it comes to Donald Trump whether see, it's Donald straight Trump is finally at the yeah. end of the day preoccupied primarily with Donald Trump yes. and his you know agenda has just gotten a lot bigger so yeah. you know when Imran Khan or Mr Modi comes to town it sort of figures and he um hmm. shoots off his mouth and says I'm really happy to mediate if both guys would like me to but we know India wouldn't like him to and therefore it's unlikely to happen so right. I mean I think that to a certain extent Donald you know he probably doesn't actually care that much yeah. that's my real you know gut feeling it's just 
you know, when they're here and both of these guys are talking about it. So he says something and says, I'm happy yeah. to broker the deal. I'm yeah. the man of the art of and the deal. And that puts us in a really difficult spot because you don't know what, you, you know, what your leverage really is when it comes to President Trump on any issue when, I mean, you know, when we've had several rounds of discussions but on if, trade as well. And that hasn't really had the kind of outcome that probably that India would have wished for. Uh, when you come to the whole week, uh, Ramachal, uh, of this, you know, of our UNGA visit. What do you think have been the tangibles? We know that the big takeaway, of course, has been the Quad foreign, uh, foreign Minister's meeting. That sort of uh, step up for India. Uh, not so much when it comes to trade. Well, for the India, yeah. the takeaways have been largely symbolic. Trump at the Houston rally was a big show. Yeah. Uh, drew a lot of international attention. It pleased a lot of Indians. The fact that the President of the United States was there at a huge public rally with Narendra Modi. But Trump went back home with concrete gains from Houston. For example, we didn't pay attention in Delhi on what he got in Houston. He got the largest gas deal in American history. Hmm. Petronet LNG signed a deal committing to invest $2.5 million dollars, billion dollars, 2.5 billion dollars yeah. in a shale gas export terminal. In addition, it's going to be buying gas you don't think worth that's 60 for billion. Us? You don't think that's beneficial for us also? You First, the Americans are selling yeah. oil to us at a higher price than Iran. Yeah. So our oil import bill has shot up because our imports from Iran have come down to zero and the Americans are trying to supplant Iran as a major oil supplier to India. Hmm. So we're buying oil from the United States at a higher price, hmm. which means our import bill has become higher. Hmm. And also we are signing these gas deals hmm. in a major way, as the acting U.S. Assistant Secretary of State, hmm. uh, Alice Wells, said yesterday, that the U.S. is focused on reducing its trade deficit with India, hmm. primarily through greater energy exports. Hmm. So these oil exports and gas exports to India are a major driver of U.S. policy to reduce trade deficit with India. Hmm. The point that I'm trying to make is that India's benefits in the past seven days have been largely symbolic, you know, like Bollywood, Bollywood type of show, for example, at, at Houston, and, and, you know, and good speeches and rallies. But how but many, how many leaders have, can uh, really pull up that kind of a crowd? Not even, I mean, the Americans who are, the Democrats who are actually engaging in rallies, uh, you know, in the run-up to the 2020 elections don't have that kind of popularity. So there, there's a little bit more than just optics there is what at least the Indians would be hoping for. But I get your point on, uh, on the, you know, on the fact that, of course, on the trade side, we've seen a lot of disappointment as well. No, uh, the trade, the trade yeah. deal is under negotiation Yeah, still, it's under negotiation, yeah. And probably will be announced within the next uh, few weeks, uh, yeah. definitely. Yeah. Because it's been largely wrapped up, but the Americans have introduced a new issue, which is they want information and communication technology mm -hmm. category to be there. Mm -hmm. And also the Americans are not willing to lift even the steel and aluminum punitive tariffs that they had imposed on India yeah. a year and a half ago. Yeah. So the Indians... I understand the, 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 the discrepancy moment. also because uh, you know the, the readouts from the Indian side and the, of course the White House were very different on what the, what the takeaways from that meeting were the bilateral between President Trump and and I yeah. also wanted to add something I mean when I said you know Trump probably doesn't care that much about Kashmir an issue that is you know of great obsession yeah. in this region he's transactional he's transactional but the one issue that he has shown that he repeatedly cares about you know not just in his dealings with India but with all the world yeah. is trade mm. and reducing America's trade deficit. That is his consistent policy yeah. obsession, yeah. actually, you yeah. know, aside from his own. Yeah. You know, so that is something that, you know, I think India is going to find itself mm -hmm. under pressure on. Um, you know, he may have loved the rally and had a great time and be really pleased with his opportunity to outreach to an important yeah. um, constituency within the broader American electorate and, you know, Indian American voters. But at the end of the day, he cares a lot about trade. Yeah. And that is in India where uh, that is an area where India is perceived by American business interests to have been a very tricky customer. And there is a lot of, you know, behind the scenes, the American business community is 
pushing for changes here and 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 so I think that is an area where you know where Trump cares a lot the one thing that I think uh, the other takeaway is of course the UNSC uh, you know the the listing committee there take you know giving that reprieve to half a say that's that's a kind of a blow I mean in some terms, the fact that the Pakistanis were able to convince the it UNSC list. of the UN system. You know, yeah, to exactly. Add somebody to the UN terrorism list, designate him as a global terrorist, yeah. and then to give him a sort of a pension on a monthly <laughs> basis. Uh, it begs the question, what is the utility of designating anybody as a global terrorist if it's only a symbolic move? What's the, the utility the, the of world US bodies job, coming the US together? Job, sorry, yeah. the U.S. job is to is to create pressure yeah. on a particular country to try and convict the person who has been designated as a global terrorist, especially because that person concerned, in this yeah. case Hafiz Saeed, is living openly and with impunity in Pakistan. Hmm. But the U.N. just adds people to its terrorism list and then forgets about them. And then this particular action of agreeing to let Hafiz Said draw the equivalent of $1,000 monthly as basic expenses for himself and his family casts unflattering light on the UN system. Yeah. Of course, it also underscores the nexus between the Pakistani state and terrorists because this request came from Pakistan government. Hmm. So obviously Hafiz Said is such a valuable asset yeah. for the Pakistani deep state yeah. that the Pakistani government, as an exception, sought yeah. the UN also, Security also Council's talks approval about the for this kind of a release. Of Pakistan's uh, claims on Kashmir and you know the the issue of Muslims in Kashmir and in fact there was a statement from the U.S. today about you know what about Uyghurs in China as well. So why aren't you talking about that? And we we know that the Pakistanis are very close to the Chinese. And, uh, you know, what, Amy, what do you think about that? The fact that, you know, what Brahma Chalani is saying, that what is the utility of these committees on, on a world body if they're not really doing anything, they're not you know, deliverables. And then, of course, the whole issue about Pakistan's, uh, you know, uh, talking about Kashmir and human rights. Yeah, so I think you've more or less just summed it up. Pakistan has very little credibility in the international community when they come out on the global stage to kind of point the finger at India and its treatment of the people in Kashmir. Yeah. And, um, you know, they claim to be acting in sort of fraternal solidarity um, with the larger Muslim community. And yet Imran Khan, when asked, in fact, by my colleague in an interview um, of the Financial Times about China's treatment of the Uyghurs, claimed to be unaware of what was going on in the Xinjiang province. Yeah. And I think it is that disconnect and, and that refusal to condemn what's happening in Xinjiang, which actually is the large scale roundup of, I think, an estimated 1.5 yeah. million people who are now in various kinds of, you know, forms of incarceration and detention. Yeah. And Imran Khan claiming to not know much about it, that has really, you know, kind of cut the floor out yeah. from under Imran Khan and Pakistan in in terms of yeah. any credibility in trying to look at what's happening in this country. Absolutely. Well, um, on that note, we're actually going to slip into a short break. Our continued coverage here of uh, the, well, the week-long uh, visit of the Prime Minister continues here. We're going to come back in just a bit. Stay with us. Mm -hmm.